In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. God created light and sky, heavens and earth, seas and land, vegetation and animals, day and night. In His own image, He made Adam and Eve and made their dwellings in the Garden of Eden. Yet they sinned and were outcasted from heaven. God had a plan for salvation, and for that, He made a covenant with one man, Abraham, and his descendants. He chose one place to implement His redemption plan, the Promised Land, the land of Israel. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. In our previous uh, episode, we have covered Calvary, Golgotha, within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Today, we're going to go and cover death of Jesus, the body taken off the cross, preparation of the body, burial, the tomb, and resurrection. If you're to notice, we're not within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We're right now on the Western Hills overlooking the old city of Jerusalem, outside the walls of the city, within an area where we have a tomb dating back to the end of the first century BC, probably the very beginning of the first century AD. And we have not chosen the weather, but it's quite interesting that today we have a Khamsin where the wind blows all the way from the Sahara, carrying with it a lot of dust. It's really hard to breathe, hot. I mean, we're around eight o'clock in the morning, and the temperature is around 33 degrees centigrade. That's around 87 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit. At noontime, the temperature is going to supposed to be around 40 degrees centigrade. We're talking about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Humid, hot, and if you even look at the visibility, it's really poor. Darkness covered earth. That's what we read in scripture when Jesus died on the cross. So why we have chosen this spot to start our third episode of the Church of the Holy Sepulchre at. First, let's go to two readings from the Gospels, and then after that, we will connect it to what we see surrounding us. And we have chosen over here two readings from the Gospel of Mark as well as from the Gospel of John, despite the fact that all the four Gospels talk about the resurrection of Jesus, about the events of that Sunday morning, more or less in the very same details. But let's go to Mark, and we'll start with that. Mark 16. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go to anoint Jesus' body. Very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb, and they asked each other, who would roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. Two things to notice over here. A large round stone, who's going to roll it away? And when they went in, the angel sitting on the right side. If we go to the Gospel of John, we have over there a similar story or similar, idea, let's say, a description of the resurrection of Jesus and the women visiting the empty tomb. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the entrance. 
So she came running to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they have put him. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked in. Let's remember over here, notice the word, he bent over and looked in. At the strips of linen lying there, but did not go in. Then Simon Peter, who was behind him, arrived and went into, look at the word, went into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the burial cloth that had been around Jesus' head. The cloth was folded up by itself, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. So, where are we? The tomb that we're sitting by is known as Herod's family tomb. Obviously, Conrad Schick, when he identified the tomb in the 19th century, he mistakenly thought that this is Herod's family. Well, it's not Herod's family, but it is a tomb of a very rich man. Tombs like this, many of them we can see around the city of Jerusalem. Down all the way in the Kidron Valley, if we go all the way down to Gehenna Valley, a bit below us, we can see tens if not hundreds of tombs cut in the rock all around the city. This one is a bit unique because of the round stone that would have covered the entrance of it. We say that this is a tomb of a rich man. Well, listen, to dig a tomb in the rock like this, that's a workmanship of a month to two. So imagine the amount of money that is needed to hire the team which will come and cut for you a tomb all the way within the rock. And many of these people would have prepared the tomb before their death. When we hear about a newly dug tomb, that means that the tomb still was not finished. Usually, you know, the tomb is over, used over and over by the family. So at the beginning, you might cut a room and within it, you will be putting three benches where the bodies will be laid in. And later on, as the need grows up, then you go on enlarging the tomb. So this is where we hear about a newly dug tomb. The tomb had two sections or two parts. This is the preparation court. So this is where the body will be pre brought, prepared for burial. Like in Jesus' case, when we hear that he was taken from the cross, his body would have been prepared first. And when we go to the Holy Sepulcher, we're going to show you the traditional spots about the preparation and talk about it a little bit more in detail. His body would have been carried, by the way, usually by two men. That's according to Jewish laws. And they would be taken all the way down into the tomb. And head first, of course, taking him all the way into the tomb and the head will be laid within the inner part of the tomb. When we look at the burial places within Jerusalem, we notice that we have two different types of burials from the time of Jesus. The one called Koch, which is basically an oven shaft, literally cut in the rock oven shaft, placed the body in with enough space for it. And the second type, which is known as the Arcosilea. That's a bench with an arch above it. Interesting, if you go to Rome, a lot of the burial places of the early Christians over there were basically dug in that style. <laughs> Amazingly or surprisingly, why would they have done that? Well, it's to duplicate how the tomb of Jesus would have looked like. So the body would have been taken in and laid on a bench. Now, how do we know it was a bench? Well, scripture tells us when the women came and looked into the tomb, they saw an angel sitting. Where would he be sitting? If it's a shaft, he would not be sitting anywhere. It must have been a bench. Then we come all the way to the description which we hear about in the Gospel of John. First of all, the stone, large stone. Now, we're not saying that the stone that uh, covered the entrance of, of the tomb of Jesus was that large. It might have been a bit smaller. But it was definitely a round discus that covered the entrance. Peter and John, they came and they went down into the tomb. Look at the steps over here coming down. You have really to stoop yourself and bent forward to go all the way into the tomb. So John would be standing looking in and then Peter comes and goes all the way into the tomb first and then followed by John. So if I would put this tomb into a couple of words, this is the best replica, a 2000 years old replica or model of how Jesus' tomb would have looked like 2000 years ago. 
We're going to take this, go to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, and see the development of the tomb at the church or within the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. We have just came all the way from uh, the King David uh, Hotel area where we have seen the tomb which is 2,000 years old. Let's take that tomb and mirror it to what we had over here 2,000 years ago. We're in the middle of the quarry, an acre and a half almost in size, and a prominent rock over here, what we have pointed as Golgotha. It was actually like a hill, a ridge, which was going down in that direction all the way toward the southern part of the complex. Jesus was crucified all the way on top of Calvary. When he died on the cross, we hear about Longinus, one of the guards, who took a spear and stabbed Jesus all the way on the side, and a mix of water and blood flowed out of the side of his body, which actually resembles the Temple of Jerusalem when they used to sacrifice over there and wash it with water. A mix of water and blood would have came from the side of the temple. Jesus is the new temple. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have went all the way to Pilate and requested the body of Christ. We hear in scripture that Joseph of Arimathea was a member of the Sanhedrin, one of the elders. A permission was granted, they come over here, they bring the body of Christ from the Calvary and they would have taken it all the way toward the tomb. Right in front of the tomb, that's where the courtyard would have stood for the preparation of the body for burial. Today, when we come inside the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, when the Byzantines built it, part of the rock, part of the hill, had to be cut out to place the church in, separating the tomb from Calvary. And only by the Crucifer period, a spot was over here placed where we have a slab, pointing it to be the stone of unction where the body of Christ was embalmed. Now, this is very symbolic. The actual spot would have been right in front of the tomb where the body of Christ was prepared. They brought the body down, following up the Jewish rules. They laid it down, flat. They closed the eyes. Usually they used to put either metals or lid to close the eyes, but we don't know about Jesus uh, having that taking place, covering up his eyes with something, but they did close the eyes. And they would tie the head and the jaw, closing up the mouth. Warm water would have been brought. They washed it quickly, they ointed it, and we do hear in scripture that Nicodemus brought 75 pounds of myrrh to anoint the body of Christ. Did Nicodemus have the myrrh purchased himself? Or perhaps Mary of Bethany, the sister of Lazarus, have brought it for the ointment of the body. After all, we hear in Bethany that she anointed the feet of Jesus as a preparation for burial, but there, it was a one liter out of a lot so perhaps the mare was brought by Mary, given to Nicodemus. The body of Christ would have been embalmed. Joseph of Arimathea brought linen. That linen would not be sewn together. That's why usually we hear about the wrapping of the body. According to Jewish laws, it should be three layers of wrapping. But we do have cases where only a one layer of wrapping was in use. And the cloth would have been placed on his face. With the body ready, as the Sabbath was just coming in, they carried the body and they took it all the way to the tomb where they have entered it. Before we go to the tomb, a couple of things to point out. The chapel which we have over here within the Armenian section of the church, which is known as the Chapel of the Three Women or the Three Marys, that's actually where the women would have stood as if watching up the crucified one. Also, it is worth mentioning that this was in use as a necropolis. We do have four burial places which were discovered within this area. 
One complex right outside the church, another one underneath the Coptic chapel at the back, the burial place of Jesus himself, and right behind the tomb, we do have over there a burial place which consists of six kochim, and that's where we point the burial place of Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea. Let's go to the tomb, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, a newly dug tomb where the holy body of Christ was entered within. The holy tomb, the edicule, which means the little house, the rotunda, which stands all the way above it. In the Byzantine period, the rotunda of the Anastasis would have looked more or less similar to what we see today, except for the galleria, that is the upper balconies, that we see on the second floor. We hear about 12 columns or pillars, which were twice high or taller higher or taller than the ones which we see over here, that would have supported the wooden dome which is above us. The diameter of the dome is about 70 feet and the upper part of the dome was open to the sky. So that means whenever it rained, we did have a problem. And that's why when we talk about the edicule throughout history, there was always a cover on the top of it till the times when they have decided to close the upper part of the dome. The rotunda, a Byzantine structure. We can say that bits and pieces of the foundations of it are dating back to the Byzantine period. With all the destructions that the church suffered, they have always went on restoring the rotunda in a similar way. Well, some minor differences, like the Byzantine one had three apses, while later on they added a fourth one all the way toward the east. As we come to look over the rotunda, the present day rotunda is dating back to the Crusader period, where they have added a second dome at the back end over there, which is known as the Martyrium. It's about half in size of the dome which is above us over here, and the vaulted arches that connects Calvary to the tomb 
of a Romanesque style to connect Calvary with the tomb, terrestrial ground with the celestial ground that is in front of us over here at the holy tomb. Throughout history, we hear about an edicule that stood over the tomb. Difference in shape, like for example, the Byzantine one, Eusebius actually gives us an image that it was square in shape. During uh, the time of Monomachos, it was octagonal in shape. The present day shape of the tomb is basically from the Crusader period, which is a polygonal structure covering the tomb itself. And the tomb itself consists of two chambers. The first chamber is known as the Chamber of the Angels because of the box which we see all the way in the center with the little candle on the top, which is housing a piece of limestone, which according to tradition, it's part of the round stone that covered the entrance of the tomb. The second chamber, that's where we have the burial chamber. Once we go all the way in it, on the right side, we do have the slab, which was recently restored. It's made of marble, covering up the bench on which the body of Christ was laid on. And right above the slab, we do have an image of the resurrection surrounded by four angels, two on the top, carrying a crown, while the ones at the bottom kneeling, worshiping the resurrected Lord. An inscription on either side of the angels mentions, the one you're seeking is risen. Christ is risen. While we can see the beautiful decoration of the tomb. Look at all the oil lamps, which belongs to the three denominations, major denominations that are actually in charge of maintaining of the tomb, the Roman Catholic, the Armenian Orthodox, and the Greek Orthodox Church. So each set of oil lamps over here belongs to the different denominations. And as we go all the way into the tomb, once again to the first chamber, we can see that little doorway. And on the doorway itself, on the left side, we can see the image of the woman bearing up the mirror, while on the right side, we can see the image of the angel, an inscription right in between the two, the one you are seeking is not here. Right above it, we do have an image of the resurrected Lord and above it, two angels with the trumpets announcing the resurrection of the Lord. The Lord is risen, the tomb is empty, and the edicule in front of us is standing as a memorial for the resurrection of the Lord Jesus.